there really are a lot of similarities in in that in production music it's just it's just one emotion it could be happy it could be sad it could be love it could be anything that music can be um, but in those tropes of the music um, it's it's goes hand in hand with scoring the picture What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Qs podcast, your weekly insight into all things production, library, and sync music. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio on the go, I just want to thank you for spending part of your day here with me. I know you have a ton of choices, so just know that I appreciate you. Also, a huge word of appreciation to the family, friends, and neighbor subscribers of 52 Qs who really do keep all of this going. If you want to learn a little bit more about how you can support 52 Qs and help keep these podcasts rolling, then be sure to tune in a little bit later because I will be going over all of that. Joining me today on the podcast is 52 Qs family member Scott McLaughlin, who is starting to push into the world of film music. And I know for many of us, this still kind of remains kind of the, the holy grail. I, I don't know. It, on some level, it does for me. I love writing production music and I love writing music that lives in a library and that's fantastic. But at the end of the day, I would still love to do more scoring to picture. It's very rewarding. It's very challenging, but it can sometimes be a really different beast. So Scott's going to join us, talk about some of his upcoming projects and how he balances the world of production music and film music and what skills transfer and what things might kind of get in the way. So we're going to be rolling that interview a little bit later. And then at the end of today's episode, I am going to be playing my latest cue, which is a garden variety dramedy cue with a little, little hip hop influence and some, some funky ukulele. We're going to be listening to a cue called Bedhead Redemption. So you definitely want to stick around for that. But first, uh, how was my week? Pretty good week, pretty quiet week as we roll into, at least here in the U.S., the 4th of July holiday. And I have uh, several kind of vacation days all ganged up. And uh, yesterday, however, yesterday was my and Shannon's 30th wedding anniversary. Yes, 30 years ago, July 2nd, 1994, uh, I believe the number one song uh, on the Billboard 100 on July 2nd, 1994 was I Swear, I Swear, right? That that song was number one. Uh, and so last night, we, Shannon and I, went to one of our favorite restaurants here in town. Um, it wasn't Marlowe's Tavern for, for you family folks. It was actually Bonefish Grill. We like Bonefish Grill. One of the best steaks I, I can find in Orlando is actually at a fish joint at Bonefish Grill. So we went last night and I got to say, it's been a long time since we've gone to a restaurant, restaurant, especially kind of on a date night, because, you know, our, our dates tend to consist of watching movies at home, maybe making up some popcorn, maybe playing some Mario Kart and uh, trash talking each other, um, or, or, uh, or just chilling out on the back, on the back patio. Right. And so we made a really concerted effort to actually go out and sit across the table from each other, phones away and just talk and hang out. And you know, she asked me, like, what do you want to do differently in the next 30 years? Like, where do, where do you want to be when we're celebrating our 60th anniversary? And we have, you know, I just turned 50. I have a real shot of, of, of getting to a 60th anniversary and an, even an outside shot of getting to 75. This is what happens when you get married when you're 20. And it was such a good question. And uh, was there anything I would change, you know, because we asked questions like that. What, what would you change? And I looked back and I thought, if I changed to this one thing, 
there would be a butterfly effect which would have kept me from being in this moment, like this is what I said to her, being in this moment with you right now. Like if, if I would have gone to Berkeley because I wanted to, to study jazz drums instead of Appalachian State, I, I might not be sitting here right now. If I had gone to high school at North Carolina School of the Arts because I wanted to study film music, that who knows where I'd be. And so uh, while it was really interesting to think about, it's a very interesting thought experiment, looking back on 30 years, it was not without its challenges, you know, both re- relationally and financially and vocationally. But, I mean, there's some things I wouldn't mind a do-over doing, but I don't think there's much I would change. I don't have many regrets. And, uh, and it was really nice to sit down and just share that with each other. And uh, at the end of the day, it was, it was a really nice night. Then we went for a ride afterwards. We took the top down, you know, because it's Florida and it's like, uh, it's getting to be sunset. So it's like 85 degrees and we have a convertible beetle. And so we're driving around, we stop and we get a coffee and we put on um, a playlist, a Spotify playlist of the hits, the top 100 from 1994. So like Ace of Bass is all up in there. We even heard like the Rod Stewart, Sting, um, Brian Adams, all for one and all for love. We heard that song. We heard some Mariah Carey. We heard some Boys to Men. And uh, man, it was so, so great. But ultimately, we are looking forward. We're looking forward to, to, to what's next and th- what I'm doing right now. And 52Q's community and everything is a huge part of that. So we got a ton of well wishes from folks in the community and Facebook and everything. Thank you so much for the anniversary well wishes. <laughs> As is typical form for our anniversary, especially early in our anniversary, we were always in the summer working, usually doing theater gigs. And so yesterday was no exception. I taught a lecture at Full Sail, did a, uh, a, an hour and a half live stream for 52 cues, had a, had two, a, me- a department meeting and had another meeting. And so we're going to be celebrating an actual kind of vacation coming up at the end of the month. But, um, but to Mrs. 52 cues, Thank you so much. Thank you for saying yes to this uh, band nerd 30 years ago and uh, looking forward to the next 30 years. So without further ado, here is my recent interview with 52Q's family member and film composer, Scott McLaughlin. You know, I always love bringing members of the community into the podcast, not just to uh, to highlight them because I think they're awesome. And for the record, I think Scott is awesome. And that's not just because he's a fellow percussionist and a drummer or that he lives in North Carolina, but um, there are some really amazing things happening in our own community here at 52 Qs, and I love highlighting that. So I am so happy to welcome to the podcast, Mr. Scott McLaughlin. Scott, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great, Dave. Thank you so much for having me here. You're such an inspiration. I I really love being part of this community. And uh, like I've told you many times, you're always (laughs) sitting on my shoulder whenever I'm composing. (laughs) Yeah, we we talked about like your shoulder angel, give you like, what would Dave do or what would Dave say? And so, so, you know, you you say that, but uh, I think anybody who works with a coach or a mentor, you know, before you do, like maybe before you, you add that chord or before you, you work that mix, you kind of think, huh, I wonder like what, what would future Dave say this in a feedback session? And so, uh, I, I appreciate that. Do you, do you find that that has gotten less and less as you kind of pr- predict my, uh, my feedback or is it just kind of seeping into the groundwater of your consciousness? Well, let's put it this way. The groundwater is probably <laughs> it, you know, in other words, there's certain things that um, maybe have punk- become entrained in my habits, <laughs> um, and then there's new challenges, and so that means that you're continuing to pour out your 
knowledge and your expertise and all of that kind of stuff, which is, you know, great for the community, great for fellow composers and, uh, you know, just never feel like you're not appreciated because you are. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And like I said, a fellow uh, North Carolinian, of course, Mrs. 52 Q's, uh, Shannon, is from North Carolina. I We both lived in North Carolina for, for a long time. We met in North Carolina. Yes. And you're in the uh, Charlotte area. Is that right? Yes. Right outside of Charlotte in a little bedroom community called Matthews. Matthews. Oh, yeah. My sister-in-law used to live in Matthews. Very familiar oh, with all okay. that. Shannon uh, went to high school in middle school. I think middle school, but high school in Albemarle. I'm sure you know where, okay. where yeah. Albemarle is. Yeah. That's just uh, right down the road. And North Carolina is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And anytime yeah. I get kind of, uh, if I get nostalgic about actually having seasons, because Lord knows Florida doesn't really get seasons, I think about about Florida. You're, you're never more than like six hours away from either snow-capped mountains or beach. And that's that's pretty amazing. That's mm-hmm. pretty amazing. That and, is true. And Bojangles and Cheerwine. <laughs> yes. You know, it's interesting that you said... Um, that uh, like I'm I'm sitting on your shoulder and you're trying new things because one of the things that you've been trying recently is getting into film music. And this is one of the big reasons I really wanted to have you on because I think if there's a logical kind of progression of the production music composer, it would seem that going into film music would be one of those things. So yeah. t- t- tell us, may- maybe maybe let's start back a little bit further. Tell us about kind of your progression into production music out from, you know, being a school teacher and elementary school teacher and all of that into production music and into film music. How, how did that story get told? Well, years ago, uh, before I became a school teacher, um, I had a company with two other gentlemen and we were located within the legendary J. Howard Production Studios, and we did commercials. And so we did a lot of regional commercials, Duke Power, and um, um, just lots of stuff. Carol Wins and mm. oh, yeah. uh, Ivy's and Belks, which you may remember oh, yeah. in Charlotte. <laughs> yep. Nothing national, so that <laughs> sort of um, made me fall in love with the collaborative process because mm. it wasn't production music, but it was music for hire for commercials. And so I would be be interfacing, collaborating with advertising executives and, um, you know, camera crews and stuff like that. And then, but that was back in the day when you had to go down to Atlanta Mm. to Crawford post-production and they literally took the film and they had to cut it. So, um, but then... At a certain point, I decided I, I had better try to get a degree. So I went to college, then I got my master's, and then I got into teaching, and then I uh, raised my son and raised a family. And then it's, at some point, I said, it's time for me to get back into composing, mm-hmm. because that was really my first love the whole time. So um, at some point, I discovered... Um, I think it was through Jesse, actually, uh, discovered production music. And then I went out to L.A. to visit my son, who lives out there, and um, started um, looking into production music companies and then got signed with one. And um, I'm still trying to write cues <laughs> for several different ones and and sort of that's sort of a truncated version sure and, and by jesse you mean jesse josephson of the sync Academy yes, and all of that yes, gotcha right. gotcha and then i discovered you shortly after that yep yeah and we yeah it was it was great you were you uh you joined us in one of the masterminds and it was absolutely yes. absolutely fantastic so some really good memories of uh, some things that still bring a smile to my face we won't get into that here but uh but really good <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Uh, that that joke was for uh, five other people on the planet who who, yes. who will understand that joke. Definitely an inside joke. Um, and so so the, the world of production music. Uh, now, as a as a musician, you're you're a drummer and a percussionist like Correct. me. Did you find that um, percu- the, your skills as a percussionist led themselves particularly well to production music? And if so, why? 
Well, let me let me think about that. Uh, I think just being um, sensitive to rhythm and also to form mm. and to structure um, attracted me because there's you know the the stop downs. There's the A section. There's the A prime. There's the the uh, area in the middle that sort of winds down. That you know there's a lot of um, um, markers that you need to hit. And through you and through others, I've I've learned uh, a certain amount of mastery in just a couple little genres, even though I've got a long journey to go. But as far as um, percussion, I would say that um, timing and mm. and sensitivity to tempo and how that affects the um, mood and affects the feel of things. Yeah, I felt. Um like a, a sense of quantization. Like I, I feel like like drummers are, are pretty sensitive to when like things are locked into a click, yes. and locked yes. into a beat. And so that, that could be easier. And 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 so your your career in production music kind of kind of built on it. And and like like us all, we're still continuing to work on it. But recently you've had the opportunity to actually score to film and score to picture. Talk first about how that opportunity came up and uh, how fast did you say yes to that? <laughs> okay. Well, I pretty much always say yes, first of <laughs> all. Um, second of all, I've done just one feature, but I've done about 10 shorts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've done several uh, documentaries and I've done some podcasts, not podcasts such as this, but like narrative podcast gotcha. with a story. Um, and so through that process that's been going on maybe two or three years now, um, I'm staying fairly consistent, consistently busy. And um, I just finished scoring a, a um, short that, that we may or may not look into <laughs> later today. And also um, am in negotiations and also in meetings with – uh, several different directors in different parts of the country. One is for a rather big um, documentary, which will be a feature. Mm. Uh, and it's got a very heavy theme. It's called Constructing Whiteness. Mm. And uh, it's, a, it's a long story, but it's going to have some pretty major hitters in it. Wow. Um, that's exciting. So I've already done the teaser for that. And um, that's going to be coming down the pike in a, in a couple months. And then there's a couple other features that I'm talking to the directors and nothing's been signed yet, but um, that's sort of where I am with that. But so, as far as the collaborative process, which is the big thing for me, uh, as far as scoring a picture, I just love the synergistic um, outcome of working with either a director or the screenwriter or the editor and how the back and forth and it's rarely talking about music. Mm. It's talking about emotion, talking about story. So emotion and story sort of ties us into the uh, juxtaposition and the marriage, maybe, of scoring to picture and production music and the similarities. Yeah, that. because in the production music world, that's we're only talking about capturing emotion. We're not trying to necessarily hit you know, beat points on film. We're not having to do any weird like metric shenanigans to make sure that when the character starts running, then the music has to go. And so yes. we are, everything boils down to root emotion. And so you, you feel Blood like, emotion. so you feel like your work as a production music composer kind of prepared you to be able to translate emotion musically. Yes. Even though with scoring, you may uh, encompass five emotions within, you know, five minute segment. Right. However, um, tr capturing that one emotion through the palette of sounds, through the, um, the tempo, through the pacing, through the form, all of that um, seriously has helped me. Um, and like I've probably mentioned this many times before to you is 
For instance, um, last week I was scoring a scene where someone was stabbed mm. and then someone was running and trying to get into a room and all of this. And I kept thinking about four bar phrases, mm. kept thinking about amping, amping this tension up. And uh, I mean, it was really just like writing a cue, like the, the final stinger before, you know, the scene change right. or something like that. Well, that's what edi- that's what editors are doing. You know, editors yeah, are taking exactly. multiple cues and then editing them down. It's just that you are editor and music supervisor and composer kind of all jumbled to one. Yes. And so then the, the final say is obviously trying to translate the vision of the director or the screenwriter, whoever you're collaborating with, because you as the composer have to translate what they're saying into music. Mm. So, um, and I really find that whole process fascinating and rewarding. Um, but there really are a lot of similarities in in that in production music. It's just it's just one emotion. It could be happy. It could be sad. It could be love. It could be anything that music can be. Um, but in those tropes of the music, um, it's it's goes hand in hand with scoring the picture. So. But but how have you transitioned into um, you know we're so focused on one emotion? Surely that's presented some some challenges, uh, maybe just different muscles of of getting mm-hmm. out of that one emotion. And what are some ways that you've uh, you've broken out of the production music? kind of f- formula for lack of it not and formula is not an f-, an f word but you know for lack of a yes. better way to say it well the way that i like to think about things is um, i think i'm a natural divergent thinker mm. meaning that connections between things come to me very easily as a matter of fact it's sort of um you know a handicap in some ways because i'm slightly add <laughs> it's a bless- uh, blessing and a curse huh Yes. So um, how that relates is I like to think of it as digging shallow holes into different areas. So in other words, you're going to take this influence here, this influence here, this influence here, and then you're going to synergize all of them together to create something new. Mm. So you have a scene that is a um, interaction between two characters, and it's tense at the beginning, but then uh, after about 15 seconds, the um, one character is expressing concern and, and, and love to the other character. So, so how do you change that? How do you go from tense to love, and so that might be your choice of instrumentation, your choice of of tempo. And so getting back to the divergent thinking thing, um, then I will go, and this is something that I've learned from you and many others, (laughs) is references. Mm -hmm. So I will will look up what other composers have done. I will study or, you know, play different music scores and and say, and say, oh, this this sounds great. What what is the essence of this? What is it that made my heart go this way in this music? And then I t- try to take that out. And by the time it goes down the windy road to the actual cue, you maybe can't see the connection. Right. If, Do you- that, if any of that made sense, no, it makes it makes perfect sense. But surely that. Exploring all of that, because at some point, Dave, the shoulder angel, is no longer is no longer right anymore because we're not. It's not production music. So, what were some of the 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 unexpected hurdles or challenges that you had to overcome as you were kind of breaking out of your production music chrysalis and spreading your wings in the in the scoring mm. venue? Um, okay, so. Sometimes cues may be short. Sometimes cues may be, uh, the one I sent you today was like three minutes and something. Mm -hmm. But um, so it getting out of the production music mindset 
it's a matter of of letting the story lead you so and not letting the chord changes or the melodies lead you mm. and so i'm really thinking emotion i'm thinking underscore and i'm going to get to the answer i'm just sort of hey no that's fine <laughs> <laughs> you're good so um so while while i'm looking at the scene um I've scored several things just reading the script, mm. you know, um, and then making a suite of things and sending it to the powers that be, and they say, yes, no, maybe, et cetera. Um, but the point being is that uh, making that transition from production music to scoring and sort of using different muscles, um, I am... Um, once again, I guess looking at how I can fuse those together. And so your question was sort of like how would you go maybe from well, tense to like, love? Like like where 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 were the friction points? Like what were some of the unexpected challenges that you maybe had to overcome because you had Dave, your shoulder angel, kind of wa wagging yes. his finger yes. in your ear? Yes. Um Mainly communication with the vision of the director mm. or the screenwriter. And there's a platform called Frame.io, mm -hmm. which is super cool, which you probably know about. But it's a <laughs> you can load um, you can load clips up to it. And then what I do when I'm scoring is the director or whoever will send me a clip. I will put it into logic. I will try different ideas. I will um, make an MP4. Then you can upload it to frame.io. At that point, anybody on the team, production team, can make a comment which is frame accurate, mm. meaning that uh, at second number five, frame number 43, um, I love what you did with the so-and-so, but then something else came in and it got in the way of dialogue. So I still haven't really answered your question. Um, but no, the I think so. I, no, no, no. Working with, you know, in the production music space, yes, we have briefs and yes, yeah. we have libraries, but ultimately we are, we rarely have direct communication or input from the final decision maker. And so I imagine that gives a certain amount of direct feedback, which can can increase the creative momentum. But if they don't like it, then it's like things come to a halt. And then like, well, I guess I'm rewriting versus writing something, putting it to the library and kind of hoping, hoping somebody will bite. Yes. It's a little bit less and of a fishing expedition. A if you have time for a little horror story. We always have time for horror stories. <laughs> Bring um, it. And it's not really a horror story because it, it had a happy ending. <laughs> um, it was, and it was not Goldilocks, but um, <laughs> it was for a, a major network or network of, of television mm -hmm. company. And I was doing a promo and the person I was working with was um, in charge of getting the music, but then there was a line of command that um, it had to go through, which I was never privy to. Mm. So um, it th the ending was good, but I ended up having to do six versions before we got it. So that was an example of not having direct communication. Uh, all ended well, and I was paid well. However... Um, it was <laughs> everybody has a boss, right? Everybody yeah, yes, has a boss. Yeah. So he liked what I did, and the other guy had, or actually two, two removed, had um, some ideas. And so by the time it filtered down to me, and I tried that, and it filtered back up to them, um, there was some lag time, and mm. finally I hit the brand. But. Uh, Gotcha. Yeah, yeah I, I've I've heard some horror stories getting getting into the uh, like thirty revision number thirty five 
uh, for big major big net network mm-hmm. stuff, pro- especially like big promo stuff, like big sporting yeah. event promos where they are 35 iterations in with small tweaks because it'll get approved and then kicked down to the next gatekeepers and then uh, or kicked up to the gatekeepers. And then they'll make a tweak and then it'll go down and then it'll go back down mm-hmm. again. And so it kind of ping pongs its way around. But when you, when you, when you have these big budgets and you have a lot of people that have to sign off yes. as a sense of, yeah. uh, it, in the uh, spirit of checks and balances, then that's yeah. understandable, but it could feel really frustrating when there are so many cooks in the kitchen. And we, and we rarely see that in the production music space. Yeah. And, and in all fairness, um, it was a pretty big promo that, that aired for a while. So it, you know, they wanted to get it perfect, which I totally understood. Yeah. So, if, there, if there are hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line, I think they get the right yeah. to, to, to ask for yeah. a few more revisions. I, to, I totally yeah. get that. So, so uh, it, it, this all begs the question, how, how did you even get into that? How, how did you go from, you know, uh, from I'm writing production music to a catalog to now find yourself scoring a feature film and shorts and docs? And h- how did that happen? Well, it started, um, believe it or not, with um, when I was in Ice Capades uh, <laughs> years ago, and I went all over the country. And now, is this as a, as, a, as a skater or a performer <laughs> or a composer? As a percussionist. Okay. I, I'm trying yeah, to imagine it, Scott like... No, I was not a skater. <laughs> um, but so doing that, I mean, this was in my early 20s, but when, when I did that... Uh, you would travel with a core group of musicians, and then every town you would go to, you would hire the musicians to play. And so it was sort of the A A list of wherever you were. So I wrote some music and had the musicians on hand record it, and I did my first movie, which was an acne movie about pimples. <laughs> All right. Like it was a, it was, a I, was it a short a short film? About? It, it was a it was actually so long ago that it was one of those movies that they played in the school uh, library. Also, oh, like a PSA kind of yes, kind of thing. Gotcha. Yes, it was a. In, they called them industrial films. Yep. All right, then shooting forward, we started music tracks where we did music for commercials. Mm-hmm. Shooting forward to that, after the teaching career, uh, my son has been making movies since he was eight or mm. 10. He's in, he lives in LA now. He's killing it in Hollywood. Awesome. Um, and so my first scored movies were for him. And I also acted in them. His name is Jordan and his website. Can I say his website? Uh, please do. Yeah. Uh, doomsdaysoiree.com. And so it's soiree, it's S-O-I-R-E-E, I I think. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely have the links in the show notes for sure. But at any rate, uh, he did some, which um, really set set the tone for his whole career. Mm. And um, and I would also act in them. (laughs) And after a certain point, he said, Dad, we're good. (laughs) Like your services are no longer required. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, right. So then I stepped back and and sort of gladly in a way. And then so then I started doing um just started meeting some people and basically like in anything else it's one job leads to the yeah. other. So I worked for one person, they recommended me to someone else, then I'm still doing that and um yeah, it's that's, still that's basically it. Relationship is still the currency that that exactly. drives yeah. this industry. You know, you started out as a percussionist playing like ice dancing shows, and then you run into somebody and they need this, and you're the guy, and you say yes, mm-hmm. and then uh, which it, it's probably. I, I know you're, you said your son makes films, but it probably makes films because he was around a dad who like loved movies and loved films and wrote music for 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 film and then that like, oh, I want to make my films. And so you just, you never know, you never know where you are, what, what, what you're doing, you know, who might be a future collaborator, who might be somebody exactly. that gets into, so, which is why exactly. I, why I tell anybody in school that school is so much more about 
uh, more than just a little piece of paper at the end of it. The networking yes. connections that you make and and I know networking is it's networking, but it's it's substitute the word networking with relationship, and that's that's how that I, works. The word networking to me scares me. Mm. I just like to have a relationship with someone and and. Um, if something works out, that's fine. If it doesn't work out, you have a friendship and, and you know, you just share who you are. And right? yeah, yeah, for me, networking uh, feels transactional. Like, what can yeah. you do for me and what can I do for you? Where relationships seems much more mutual. Like, right. how can we help each other? And I, this might just be semantics or whatever. And, but. and once again, You've got the heart of the teacher, and and mm. um, you know that's. I feel a connection to you. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's no doubt that if if you knew somebody like in Orlando that needed some help, you would probably recommend me. Of course, you're close enough; you can just oh, fly course. down yourself yeah. or whatever. But but yeah, a- absolutely, because relationship is still king. Um, and so uh, b- before we, we wrap up here, I want to also touch on collaboration. Because this is another another thing that can be t- tough for us production music folks, because we are in our studio, we do so much in the box, so much ourselves, and if we record something, you know, I'm going to buy a cello instead of hiring a cellist, or I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to buy a ukulele instead of you know getting somebody to play ukulele or or whatever. And so, has that been a learning curve, learning to collaborate either with other musicians or collaborate? Uh, with, you know, writers and directors and talk about that adjustment. That to me, that is one of the exciting things. Uh, This past weekend, um, two days ago, I had written a flute suite or ensemble for uh, contrabass flute, Mm. bass flute, C flute, piccolo, alto flute. And it was for a big music festival uh, in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. And so I was collaborating, which was not film, but I was collaborating with the whole flute ensemble, with the director, with the director of the festival. And everyone had their own vision. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that kind of stuff is where the human aspect really comes in mm-hmm. and the um you know, kumbaya humanity of it all that that I love because I feel that everyone, like 52 Qs, you've got your superpowers, you Mm -hmm. know, everyone has a superpower. And so back to the film edge of it, um, when you are talking to the person that has been living with this project and breathing and sweating and, you know, Mm giving up their sleep for yeah. this project and you come in on the tail end and you're supposed to um, manifest, you know, the emotion and all that. To me, I I just love that process of hearing their vision and then trying my best to translate it into sound. Um, so, yeah, that's, a, that's sort, of, a- sort of an affinity to that. Um, and that's yeah, it. that that's 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 a, that's a really good perspective to have because you might get called in after things are shot, you know, and you might be living with the music for a couple of months, but the director, especially like independent films, the director is usually the writer, right? They this has probably been in their heart for years. Oh yes, and so Definitely. you kind of sweet. So ego has to take a, a back seat. You have to figure out how can you help someone tell their story that's been in their soul for years and years, and yes. that's uh that can be really humbling. If you come in there like a bull in a china shop, and you're like, yeah, I'm I'm the boss, I'm the creative, I'm here. You know, I, I don't think you'll get much work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the last thing I want to say, and I just want to to acknowledge that. Since you've been doing, especially more recent, your more recent film work, and, and actually b- b- before we do, I, I do want to take a moment and hear some of your work uh, because you did give us a clip. And so let's let's do that thing like they do at talk shows. You know, it's like, hey, okay. why don't you uh, set up this clip for us, Scott? What are we about to hear? What are we about to watch? Okay. This, Dave, <laughs> is from the movie called Grace. 
And it is a psychological thriller that was written by a collaborator, uh, Andrew Smith, and the director was Anish, Anish, and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce his last That's name. Totally fine. Yeah. But he was a great collaborator. Um, and I'm looking for my notes here. I don't <laughs> see them. Uh, anyway, it's it's a scene where the lead Grace is going through um, grief stricken. Um, moment of anxiety and mental breakdown. Mm. And so she self-medicates, and then at the end of the scene, she finds a way to sort of bring her back, self back to equilibrium, but the darkness is, is there, and it's seeped in deeply. And so my task was to try to... Um, tell that story through music. And so I could explain the whole thing, but I think maybe just watching the clip and then maybe discussing some of it afterwards would help. Don't worry about it. I'm sure he's okay. I'm gonna call now. Hey, Grace, are you okay? So that was a clip from the film Grace. Scott, that's, that's amazing work, man. That's amazing. And I know you, you wanted to give a shout out to uh, to the actress in that scene. Yes. Melissa Brown was the lead actress, and uh, she's a, a regional actor to North Carolina and um, doing great things. That's 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 awesome. So, um, so tell us about some of the maybe the techniques that you used uh, in the, in the in the score for that scene. Okay, if you remember at the beginning, she is calling and she's looking out the window and she's calling a friend about her son who has disappeared. And so we chose, and this was a collaborative process, for the music not to enter until her friend states that she will send her some home. And so to be underscored and non-obtrusive, I started out with a drone. However, 
as you can see, things take a dicey turn down south. <laughs> and so she just sort of takes the phone away from her head and she's into her inner dark thoughts. So then I uh, introduced some sort of aleatoric um, string plucks, random string plucks that sort of represented emotionally where she was. And then sort of a drony, plucky um, double bass that was sort of stuck in a loop. And then she, um, and this is, uh, this could all be tied in very neatly to a tension cue mm -hmm. um, and maybe an alt mix of a tension cue. Right. And then she goes to the cabinet and she gets her uh, mini bottles out and that continues. And then the camera pans back and, and then it's a transition. So it's sort of like a stinger mm -hmm. that they use in production music. And she's cleaning the stairs. Then she gets the call from the uh, detective, and it's this low string rumble. And then uh, she gets, she listens to the phone call, and she realizes that she may be in trouble. And so she goes, spirals yeah. into the deep end, and, so, so and how, that's when she lights the candles. Yeah, how much? How much of that was it like recorded elements, or was this all in the box, like all programmed, or? Uh, it's all in the box. It, it was different programs, and um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, but you're really, really, really well done. How um, is this uh, film uh, being being released? Is it kind of being shopped around in the festivals? Can anybody go out and see this film right now? Uh, it's going to have the premiere later this month. It's uh, right now. It's in post production. It's in the color. It's. The, the the actual version that you see now uh, has not had the audio mix, has gotcha. not had the colorization. And so it's it's sort of premature, but um, I got their permission yeah. to do it. Yeah, that's and, fantastic. Uh, so it will be coming out. It will be going through festivals. It will be having a premiere in Charlotte. Uh, and it'll be put up on YouTube, and I don't think they're going to go for any distribution. Okay. I'm not quite sure, All but right. the uh, the main thing is they're just going to keep doing it and hopefully hiring me. Yeah, yeah, there there you go. Well, it was really well done, and I just want to say it's been awesome to, to kind of see your progression in this, uh, especially, if I may say, and I've said, that, I've said this during one of our feedback sessions or several, I can hear how you working in film has had an impact on the, well, for lack of a better word, the sophistication of your cues. Do you think that that is something that you're just conscious of, or is it kind of composing outside of the the the, the formula of production music and it's just having an impact? Or talk, talk a, a, just a little bit about that, about how it, it has been going back into your production music and the influences scoring has had sure so most of as you know most of my experience with production music is with tension mm -hmm. and uh things that are dark and uh i don't know what that says about me but uh yeah, i mean you're a really super nice friendly d dude so i, I <laughs> <laughs> but um the what the projects even though i've done dramedy i've done uh the rom-com i've done um lots of different styles in the scoring when I'm sort of drawn to is the psychological drama is the, the thriller is, and I haven't done a horror movie, but I would like to do that. Um, not to say that, that I don't love, you know, plucky strings and, and, the, and the xylophones and the marimbas as well. But so um, in answer to your question, um, I'm sort of going with what's coming naturally mm. and um, which in a way is maybe a cop out because, um, but I'm sort of with that area, I'm going deeper as opposed to divergent. Is that, and that's what um, I'm hearing there. There, like I said, it's, it's yeah. the, the word that comes to mind is a sophistication. There's just, there's an emotional depth to your cues that I think only after you have, practice this a lot and doing this in a film setting gives you direct access to is this emotion working like the director will tell you yes. nope it's not it's too fast too slow yes. it's too happy or, or whatever whereas when you're working on cues you just kind of throw them up and, and hope that they nail it but and as a, as a matter of fact 
that scene that you saw, which was called the, we called it the insanity scene, which mm-hmm. he's not really insane, but um, when you have the, the aleator extreme plux and, and some other stuff, that particular composition informed a production cue that I did, that, and I forget the name of it now, but I basically used that cue as a starting off point and put it into the production music template. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, Scott, man, first of all, congratulations. I hope it's okay. I'm super proud of you. I hope that's okay to say, uh, you know, I consider you you, one of my own here. Um, but man, I wish you so much success. It couldn't happen to a nicer, friendlier, just, just, uh, you're, you're just a, a good person. And, uh, I wish you more and more success. Thank you so much for joining me today. And if you want to, if you want to see some of Scott's stuff, you can check out Scott McLaughlin music.com or Scott McLaughlin uh, music.bandcamp.com. And of course we're going to have links to a uh, doomsday soiree and the grace movie. Cause by the time this comes out, the grace might be released, but we'll, we'll see if we can't dig up some links. But Scott, thank you so much for joining me today. And Dave, once again, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, once again, heart of the teacher, Mm -hmm. you're on my shoulder, Sherpa. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you, my friend. Once again, a huge word of thanks to Scott for joining me on the podcast and huge congratulations. It could not happen to a nicer guy. And uh, like I said, we're going to have all the links in the description below. So we're going to take a really quick break and an alternate universe version of me is going to tell you how you can join 52 Qs and also support everything that we do here. But when we return, we're going to be checking out my latest hip hop dramedy Q, Bedhead Redemption. Every week I talk about how this episode and the podcast and the community, the channel would not be possible without the amazing support of our family, friends, and neighbors, subscribers of 52Qs, who do pay their actual real life money to keep all of this going. And in addition to being thriving members of the community, as well as supporting me and Shannon and everything that we're doing here, they also receive extra perks like live streams, workshops, Zoom feedback sessions, hundreds and hundreds of hours of video archives, weekly cue breakdowns, production music almanac, uh, living ebook, and the opportunities to submit to real music libraries. Now, it's free to join 52Qs. You can just go to 52Qs.com and sign up, be a member of the community. We would love to have you. It will always be free to join the community. But if you've been watching, or if maybe this is your first time, but if you're wondering Is there a way to kind of level up my production music skills in the industry, meeting like-minded, super friendly, very generous composers? Then why don't you think about subscribing? Memberships start at around four bucks a month and we would love to have you. Again, that's 52Qs.com.
So that was Bed Head Redemption. It's uh, my latest little plucky dramedy cue, complete with funky ukulele, little hip hop beats. For you family and friends subscribers, you can check out a complete breakdown of this cue in tomorrow's cue breakdown. But that is going to do it for me this week. You definitely want to tune in next week where I am going to unpack the various types of orchestral articulations. Like, like I know that, that we come from many different backgrounds. And if you didn't grow up in band or whatever, you might not know the difference between staccato and legato. You might not know the difference between tremolo and spiccato. And what's a Bartok pits? You know, so what we're going to do is we're going to open up a plugin. We're going to specifically look at BBCSO and we're going to unpack the various types of orchestral articulations that you need to know when you go to work your production music cues. So you definitely want to tune in for that. And uh, as always, a huge word of thanks to the family, friends and neighbors, subscribers. And you know what? Whether you support the channel financially or not, the fact that you are watching just know that I love and appreciate you. Thank you so much. And while you're at it, why don't you think about paying it forward a little bit with a thumbs up or maybe even subscribe to the channel. Uh, tell a friend, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, uh, send a carrier pigeon. <laughs> uh, but these kind of things really do help folks find us and helps the channel grow. And if you're listening to the audio on the go, then uh, how about a review? That goes a long way. But that's going to do it. Thank you again for joining me. I hope you've had an amazing week 27. I'm looking forward to a fantastic rest of our year. And I know it's going to be great. How do I know that? Because I believe and trust that the universe has amazing plans just for you. Until next time, everybody. Peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2024, 818 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community or becoming a member subscriber of 52 Cues, head over to 52Qs.com.